And in between I drink black coffee She was standing there with my A lot of people may be familiar with the theory of evolution. Within the theory of evolution, it's believed that most species evolved from a common ancestry. Pretty much being that although these similarities may be super unrecognizable today, millions of years ago it can be found that species today and species then can share the same common genetic variations that still remain. And I think the same type of theory can apply to music. Regardless of the genre, the artist, or even instrumentation, I think there are elements that can be related for music of the past and music of the present, and that will keep on occurring as time moves forward. Whether these variations be a motif, maybe a little riff here, certain styles, certain techniques, they're just little things that can be connected. In this video, I'm excited to be exploring some of these same variations and connections between seven singers of the past and the present, all narrowing down to one of my favorite artists, Jasmine Sullivan. In my opinion, which is pretty much a fact because it's my opinion, <laughs> I think that Jasmine could easily go down as one of the greatest vocal beasts of this generation. For a fact. I said what I said, period. <laughs> Jasmine's been playing the role in R&B music since the late 2000s, the 2010s, and is still making an impact today in 2020. Baby, it's Jasmine's timbre, that tone, that skill, the agility, the runs for me, child, okay? I could talk about Jasmine so much I could write a paper. <laughs> Which is what I did. <laughs> in this video, the six other singers I chose to analyze in relation to Jasmine include Ma Rainey, Ella Fitzgerald, Etta James, Shaka Khan, Brandy Norwood, and Jill Scott. Now, amongst these names that I just listed, you might have noticed a bit of a theme. Could you figure it out? Did you figure it out? Well, I am a black woman, and I take pride in being a black woman. Regardless of the struggles that come with, I acknowledge all the blessings that it comes with as well. And it's because of that pride that I chose to analyze all black women in my project today. Because black women play a humongous role in the development of my artistry and the artist that I am today. So it's only right that I acknowledge this and appreciate this and study some of the greats that existed before me. As you can see in this genealogy, I have blue lines starting from Ma Rainey going into all the artists, and I have a purple line working its way up starting from Ma Rainey to Jasmine Sullivan. Pretty much that's just going way back in time and dating these influences, streaming all the way uphill to present time today with Jasmine Sullivan. The blue lines represent how Ma Rainey had an influence in all these artists in one shape or way or another. Ma Rainey was born as Gertrude Pridget on allegedly, allegedly now, April 28th, 1886 in Columbus, Georgia. Now I say allegedly because they, some say like her birthday may have been in actually September, but they're going with the date April. I guess that's the most recognized date. Today, Ma Rainey is known as a blues legend, a legend, okay? She began her career singing and dancing at local talent shows. Ma Rainey is one of the first artists to incorporate country blues into her repertoire, which other artists would soon follow suit. Now, although Ma Rainey was not the first person to record a blues song, her sound influenced the person that did, Mammy Smith. She was also the mentor of Bessie Smith. Many artists have found influence from Ma Rainey's work. Even a famous writer from the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes, has found inspiration from her work. Ma Rainey's performances have caved a way to help many black artists around the spectrum, even beyond music, and has continued to pave a way for artists today. In the 1900s, Ma performed at the Springer Opera House. In 1904, she married William Rainey and became the duo Ma and Pa. 
Later on in 1905, Ma Rainey would go on to discover the blues sound. It wasn't originally her repertoire, but she went on some travels and discovered the country blues, and of course, incorporated to her songs. In 1912, Ma was introduced to Moses Stokes' troupe. In 1915, she would go on to tour with Fat Chapel's Rabbit Foot Minstrels, and they would be known as the Assassinators of Blues. In 1916, Ma would go on to divorce her husband. In 1923, she recorded her first record with Paramount Label, featuring a song called Bo Weevil's Blues. In 1924, Rainey's traveling band, the Wildcat Jazz Band, recorded Thomas A. Dorsey. Now, if you don't know who Thomas A. Dorsey is, I'm going to let you know now. He is known as the father of gospel, the modern gospel that we know today. In 1928, the last recording session was done by Ma Rainey. In 1935, Ma Rainey retired. Even in today, 2020, Ma Rainey has influences. Today, there is a new Netflix film out called Ma Rainey's Black Bottom starring Viola Davis and Chadwick Bosman. Now you'll be hearing me singing along with Ma Rainey on her song, The Jealous Hearted Blues. You can have my money, baby. Ain't got home, but for God's sake, leave my bed alone. Cause I'm jealous, jealous, jealous hiding me. Lord, I'm just jealous, jealous as I can be. It takes a rocking chair to rock, a rubber ball to roll. Takes the man I love to satisfy my soul. Get him jealous, jealous, jealous hearted me. Lord, I'm just jealous. Jealous as I can be Next we have Ella Fitzgerald, great of jazz and is known as the first lady of song today. She would begin her career performing at the Apollo. Originally she went there to dance, but there were a group of sisters that were known to get down and busy, so she was like, let me not do that. And she decided to sing. And of course, the crowd loved her. In 1935, she would go on to win a performance with the Tiny Bradshaw Band at the Harlem Opera House. And that's where she would meet Chick Webb. Chick Webb played a huge part in her development as an artist. In 1936, she recorded her first recording. In 1938, she would go on to record one of her first hits, finally starting to draw in attention. That hit was a rendition of A Tisket, A Tasket. In 1939, Chick Webb would pass and Ella would become the new band leader. In 1946, she would meet her husband, bassist Ray Brown. It was through Ray that Ella would go on to meet and sign with Norman Grant, and who asked Ella to join the Philharmonics. Norman was one of the influences in her life that would take Ella to a higher level in music and have audiences pretty much around the world knowing of Ella Fitzgerald. In the 1950s through the 60s, she began recording her songbooks. She would record her cover albums, perform TV shows, and she befriended Marilyn Monroe. I decided to mention this because Marilyn had an impact on her status beyond race. There was a popular nightclub, and Marilyn told that owner, You better have Ella performing. If you have Ella performing, I'll be at your nightclub, front row seats, watching my girl Ella. So, guess what that nightclub owner did? He hired Ella. Ella went on to say that after the performance, she never played a small club again. In 1887, she won a National Arts Prize, and in 1991, her final concert was at Carnegie Hall. Now you will hear me singing along with Ella's rendition of Black Coffee.
I'm feeling mighty lonesome Haven't slept a wink I've walked the floor and watched the door And in between I drink Black coffee Love's a hand-me-down I'll never know a Sunday in this week day I'm talking to the shadows one o'clock to four and Lord how slow the moments go when all I do is pour black coffee since the blues called mine I was hanging out on Monday My Sunday dreams to dry On January 25th, 1938, in Los Angeles, California, a one Miss Jen Stutter Hawkins, who you guys may know as renowned R&B singer Etta James was born. Etta was born to a young mother, but still her mother was very highly supportive of her career. Her mother once said, even if a song has been done a thousand times, you can still bring something of your own to it. And I thought this was important to mention because a lot of times people may say, many are called, but very few are chosen. There are so many artists out there that may be doing something so similar to you. But I think it's important for artists to know that there is something that you can add to the table. There is always something you can contribute. So you should never feel down about that. You should always pursue what you want to pursue. I should record Roll With Me Henry, which was actually changed to Wallflower. It was changed because they thought the content of the song was too grown. So they ended up changing the title just to avoid the controversy. In 1955, she would begin her solo career. With the song Good Rocking Daddy. In 1960, she would sign to Chicago's Chess Records. In 1970, she would open for the Rolling Stone. 1977, she would sign with the Warner Bros. In 1984, she would actually perform the Olympics in Los Angeles, performing when the Saints go marching in. In 1993, she would be introduced to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. In 1994, she would win a Grammy Award. In 1999, she would be introduced to the Grammy Hall of Fame. In 2001, the Blues Hall of Fame. 2003, she would win a Grammy Award. And also in 2003, she would have a gastric bypass surgery. I decided to mention this because she said that after the surgery, she was able to sing higher. And I guess that's something that happens when people, like an artist, may lose drastic weight. It actually takes a toll on their vocal cord. A, a more current example of this, maybe with Adele, people are saying that since she lost so much weight, she's lost some uh, a little bit of her tone and darkness of her voice. That's up for you to listen and see if you think the same. In 2004, she won another Grammy Award. And in 2008, she was portrayed by Beyonce in Cadillac Records. Now, it wasn't a based on a true story, but she did perform some of her originals. I think I like Beyonce's voice, and of course, everybody loves Beyonce, but I think they could have found maybe a singer with a more similar rasp, darkness, and fullness to their voice that would have suited Ella's character a little bit more, her sound a little bit more. Although, of course, Beyonce did a phenomenal job. That's just my little two cents on looking at her style and technique. Now you will hear me performing some of All I Could Do Was Cry by Eddie James. I heard church bells ringing I heard a choir singing I saw my love walk down the aisle 
on her finger He placed the ring Whoa, oh, oh, I saw them holding hands She was standing there with my man I heard the promise until death do us part. Each word was a pain in my heart. Next up, we have a Chicago native in the house, Miss Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan was born March 23rd in 1955. Growing up in the Hyde Park area. Fun fact, I live pretty close to Hyde Park. <laughs> While in Chicago, Shaka was active in the civil rights movement. She, she was introduced to this from one of her stepfather's girlfriends. She was also befriended with the Black Panthers, Fred Hampton. Shaka grew up in a house with musicians. Her brother and her sister had their own perspective groups. And of course, Shaka would grow up herself to become a funk legend. Shaka even has a whopping 10 Grammys under her belt. And although she is an R&B and funk legend, she's also familiar with soul, pop, disco, jazz, and gospel. In 1972, Shaka would join up with Rufus. Shaka would perform in many groups around Chicago, and eventually in 1972, she would link up with Rufus. With a new front face, Shaka Khan, the group would begin to start getting more attention. In 1973, Rufus was signed to ABC Records, and their album, Rufus, would drop as well. In 1974, Stevie Wonder would pen their song, Tell Me Something Good. This is something I never knew. And now that I think about it, Tell Me Something Good still got a little bit of Stevie twang on there. And now that I think about it. In 1978, Shaka would begin her solo career signing with Warner Bros., the group would still go on to release their album, Rufus Street Fight, and Shaka would also release her solo album, Shaka. She would take a bit of a break from the group, but in 1979, she would record another album of Rufus that was produced by Quincy Jones, Master Jams. Shaka has worked with the likes of Dizzy Gillespie, Prince, Mary J. Blige, Miles Davis, and the London Symphony Orchestra. Now I'll be going on to singing one of her songs with Rufus, Everlasting Love. When I feel you dreaming, I think of sunsets, how high. My high gets I wanna give to an everlasting love. I wanna fill your life with a satisfying love. All you need is an everlasting love. All you want is a satisfying love. We have Brandy Norwood, or as most people know her as, Brandy. You can't talk about modern R&B without bringing up Brandy. Brandy has influenced so many artists. And even today, you can hear a lot of that smooth, kind of soft, you know, flowy R&B in a lot of subgenres of R&B today. In 1993, she signed to the Atlantic. 
1994, she released her self-titled platinum debut album, Brandy. In 1995, she would open for Boys to Men. In 1996, she would collab with Tamia, Shaka Khan, and Gladys Knight on the single, Missing You. She would also star in her successful sitcom, Moesha. <laughs> I am a Moesha fan. <laughs> Although she was a little bratty on that show, I am a Moesha fan. <laughs> it was during the success of the show that she would take a break from music. During this time, she would also back out from filming the film Set It Off. Now, I did not know this. If you know, Set It Off is like a black household classic. And I could not see Brandy being in that movie at all. So I guess I bet she saw that too. And she was like, I'm not going to do it. She would also go on to make her theater debut in I Know What You Did Last Summer. Okay, so now I think about it, that's that's a scary movie that you wouldn't think Brandy would be in, but she was in it. So I guess she could have been and set it off too. <laughs> in 1997, she would be handpicked by Whitney Houston to play Cinderella in Roger Hammerstein's TV version of Cinderella. Cinderella would give the network its highest ratings it had in 16 years. And of course, this would be a big deal to Brandy because as I mentioned before, that's one of her idols. Like, that's the main reason why she decided to pursue music in the first place. Of course, that'd be a big deal to her. In 1998, she would return to music, releasing her second album, Never Say Never, which would be her biggest selling album. On that album, she would have to hit The Boy Is Mine featuring Monica. And that would become the first first number one single and most successful female single duo in the industry i did not know the song had that much recognition and of course the boy is mine is a bob so as to be expected <laughs> now you hear me singing one of her records have you ever have you ever loved somebody so much it makes you cry? Have you ever needed something so bad you can't sleep at night? Have you ever tried to find the words but they don't come out right? Have you ever? Have you ever? Have you ever been in love, been in love so bad you do anything to make them understand? Have you ever had someone to steal your heart away? You give anything oh, to make them feel the same. Have you ever searched for words to get you in the heart? But you don't know what to say And you don't know where to start Next up we have a Miss Jill Scott Now you cannot talk about Neo so without mentioning Miss Jill Jill began her music career later than the artists I've mentioned today She actually would begin her career after she decided that being an English teacher was no longer the path for her. And even before that, she would go on to pursue theater. And I think that's important to mention because it just shows that it's never really too late to do what you want to do. And you can always find time to do what you want to do. But after she decided that she didn't want to be a teacher anymore, she would go on to pursue acting and go on to pursue spoken word. It was actually through a spoken word performance that she was discovered by Quest Love. In 1999 is when she'd be discovered by Questlove, getting her writing credit in the song featuring Erica Badu, You Got Me. In 2000, the You Got Me single featuring Erica Badu and The Roots would win a Grammy for Best Rap Performance Duo Group. She would also collab with Will Smith in Common. During the 2000s, she would also tour for Canadian production of the Red Musical. She did this to get more stage training and be more comfortable in her stage performances. Her debut album, Who Is Jill Scott? Words and Sound, Volume 1, would also be released. In 2003, she'd be nominated for a Grammy and Best Female Vocal Performance. In 2004, her album, Beautiful Human, Words and Sounds, Volume 2, would be released, and she would appear in the TV show Girlfriends. In 2005, she would receive a Grammy for Best Urban Alternative R&B Performance for Cross My Mind. 
In 2007, she would win a Grammy for Best Traditional R&B Vocal Performance and appear in the film Hound Dog. She would also appear in the film Why Did I Get Married. Next, you'll be hearing me sing some of Jill's song, He Loves Me. You love me a specially different every time you keep me on my feet happily excited by your cologne your hands your smile your intelligence you woo me you caught me you tease me you please me you school me give me something to think about ignite me you invite me you co-write me you love me you like me you inside me to Chorus Ooh. Now to our time travels, we have finally reached the lady of the hour, Miss Jasmine Sullivan. Jasmine is definitely an underrated GOAT. And to be honest, she could easily go down as one of the best vocalists in this generation. Like I said before, I said what I said. Now legend has it. That just one single Jasmine Sullivan note can send you to ecstasy. Legend or facts, you decide. She would go on to perform vocals for Kendrick the Family Souls records, I Am, and Parties Over. It is through these collaborations that she would later meet rap icon and producer Missy Elliott. I found this collab like, really interesting because Jasmine was actually raised in a house of secular music. Like for long as a time, she only listened to secular gospel type musics. So it's funny like the collaboration that would help her further her career would be with a rap artist, which, you know, rap would be considered on the more radical side of the spectrum. So I found this collab really interesting. Missy Elliott would go on to produce a majority of her debut album as well as her sophomore album. In 2003, Jasmine would meet Missy Elliott. In 2008, she would release her breakthrough single, Need You Bad. She would also debut her album, Fearless, which had number one on Billboard's top hip-hop and R&B albums and number six on top 200 Billboard albums. In 2009, she would be a nominated for a Grammy in the following categories best contemporary r&b album best female r&b vocal performance best new artist best traditional r&b performance and best r&b song she will also release her sophomore album love you back in 2011 she'll be nominated for best r&b vocal performance in 2011 she would also go on to take a three-year hiatus she had said she had gotten to a point where it just really wasn't fun anymore and music just didn't feel as good as it used to be. She also would go through a lot of personal things and relationship issues that things just weren't feeling as good. And I think a lot of artists can relate sometimes that sometimes you just go into this funk like you kind of don't want to even sing or play a song. You just kind of don't want to think about it. And to be honest, I've, I had that feeling. Early in the pandemic, I didn't want to even listen to music. Like I didn't want to hear it at all. So I can definitely relate to that. In 2014, she returned with an album announcement. In 2015, she would release her third album, Reality Show. In 2020, Jasmine has released the singles Lost Ones and Pick Up Your Feelings and announced her fourth album. Now you will hear me sing a part of Jasmine's song, Mascara. In my hair, in my ass face But so what? I get my rent paid with it And my tears give me trips to places I can't but now try He said he keep it coming if I keep my body tight And them bitches stay mad Cause I'm living the life Cause I'm living the life Oh 
People think I'm shallow cause I'm always dressed like I'm going out to the club But I gotta keep up cause there's new chicks popping up every day And they want the same thing So I never leave the house without makeup on I keep my skill in my pocket if I'm running to the market Cause you never know who's watching you So I gotta stay on I gotta stay on, I gotta stay on, I gotta stay on, I said I gotta stay on. Now I know why you looking at me like that, it ain't attractive when you looking at me like that. Girl, don't be mad, cause why you cooking dinner for your broke nigga? You could be in the gym working on your figures. Don't I deserve to be privileged? Don't I deserve to get the very best? Cause it ain't easy being this fine all the time Cause if it was, then we all could do it But we can't now, no The show bitch don't kill my vibe Don't be mad cause you coach class and I'm in that G5 I Beautiful girls run the whole world Now I gotta stay young After hearing and learning about these ladies I hope that some of these connections and similarities have started to make themselves apparent and I hope I can further unfold this through this next analysis section. In this section I will just be discussing elements of their music and seeing how these artists connect to Jasmine as well as amongst each other. Now to start off this section I really wanted to unpack just how big of a significance Ma Rainey has been to not only all of these women, but she has been a pioneer for black artists alike across the spectrum of the entertainment industry, no matter man or woman. As I mentioned before, Ma Rainey participated in Fat Chapel Rabbit Foot Menstruals. And as some may know, if you don't know, I'll let you know. Menstrual shows were a way to mock and degrade black people, but... For a lot of black artists, that was the first type of ways they can get performance jobs, composer jobs, and so forth. So although it's it's like a bittersweet feeling or like a double-edged sword, because you may think like, man, I wish she wouldn't have had to do that, or you, you like, man, I would not have wanted to do that. It's because some of the sacrifices that artists like Ma Rainey made that opened doors for more black artists and more black performance to have their space on stage and to have their space in the music industry that we're still trying to push for more space for and more acknowledgement within. So I thought this was important to unpack. Not only that, many black women in early blues along with Ma Rainey were some of the first women to show autonomy over their body even before a second wave feminism. With all of this, I thought it was very important to acknowledge all of the impact that Ma Rainey has had for so many people. First, starting with the comparison between Ma Rainey and Jasmine, within both their songs that I've sang today, something I noticed amongst them were three eight note pickups, eight note pairs, and the sliding of notes. And I think the sliding of notes came from pretty much like the bending of guitars and blues and it would go alongside to be mimic with the voice. Like in mascara, she said something like, girl, don't be mad. Like she didn't say, girl, don't be mad. She, girl, don't be mad. She worked her way up. The three pickup note thing, like the in mascara, she goes like, no, I know why you looking at me like, I feel like that's something I do a lot too. Is like a, I do like a lot of pickups, and I think that can probably attribute to some of like the singy talking that happens a lot in different genres, including the blues. And I think that can even work its way down into rap. Within both Jasmine and Ella's work, something I noticed were low note leaps, like like doing leaps in like the three range, jumping up to the four as well as eighth note triplets, and again, you have the vocal slides. And I think now we see the vocal slide going from the slide of guitar to the bending of horns in jazz during Ella's time. Now the low notes, the low note leaps is pretty something big in Jasmine's repertoire. Like, as you heard in mascara, um, you're my hair and my ass fade. Sorry, them low notes. When I'm tired, them bad boys is questionable. But you get the point. 
that you hear that a lot in her works and i think leaps in the lower register is something i notice as like very much more comfortable for me than trying to do a leap and like not even higher in my register even in my and within my tessitura that's very comfortable sometimes thirds can even get a little cracky for me so but it's funny because i find low no leaps to be pretty easy of course some of the triplets can be attributed to kind of trying to achieve some of the swung feel that was very popular during ella's time and i think you see these little type of triplet moments during well uh I shouldn't say specifically triplets, but when I say triplets, I mean like a uh, quarter to a ooh, eighth note to a quarter note, those type of boom, boom. It gives this type of swung feel in modern music now today without it having even to actually be played in a swung groove exactly. Next we have Edda and Jasmine. And once again, I've noticed these vocal slides. I've also noticed the triplets once again. And I noticed a quick run. Now, that I'll talk about runs a little bit later on, but I, this is like one of the earliest examples that it starts coming up amongst like the artists that I've shown, and it will start grounding itself later on, and I'll discuss it a bit more. For Shaka and Jasmine, something I've noticed was like a dotted note for eights, as well as syncopation, as well as a little bit more of the runs. As you see again, runs are really starting to make its way, coming moving forward in time and making its way present as a type of embellishment and decoration to the song. We can also see our bending of notes still trickling down, still making its way in, no matter the genre, still being present. Next, we have Jasmine and Brandy. And I think this is where the use of runs really like set its fruits and really grounded itself was the 90s. And Brandy was one of them girlies that was gonna do a run. In the 90s, the runs was like the singer's most favorite tool in their toolbox. Like doing a run was the equivalent of breathing for R&B singers in the 90s. It don't matter the phrase or where you will see a run. And I've highlighted that there was a standalone run in Brandy's work to show just how prevalent it was. Like runs, they use runs not even as how it would normally be used, how I, how it was seen earlier at like the end of a note, like it's like an ending note, but it was just extended a little bit more of the run. Now you see runs just kind of being thrown in there. Like, uh, we, we see them runs coming up, we see them. And of course, Jasmine is a run, that girl's a sprinter, okay? That girl is a track star when it comes to runs. You see that heavily in their work. And also I highlighted some of the repetition that's seen. Like we have these like sessions of 16th notes in Brandy's work. And you see the repetition in eighth notes. And I think that can be attributed once again to that, that talky type singing I was mentioning earlier in Ma Rainey's work, working its way down as rap is starting to become more prevalent during this time too. So now you're seeing things like that arise. Moving forward, going to Jasmine to Jill. With Jasmine and Jill, I, where I kind of focused on their type of comparison is within their production. Like, they're heavy on R&B mixed with hip-hop. And I think because it started to be grounded with this combination during Jill's time in the 2000s and early 2000s. And one reason I think that was because, because, we, because, because, I think it happened as... With Neo Soul and Conscious Rap, they were able to kind of flow between the spectrum. Like you would have a, you would have the same type of backing music in a Conscious Rap song that you would have in a Neo Soul song. In a Neo Soul song, along with singing, you would have a spoken word that can even be related to rap. So you kind of see this flow between spectrum, and you see this move forward into more genres and variations of rap as you go into like the 2000s. In the 2000s you will always see an R&B song with a hip-hop feature or a hip-hop feature with an R&B song. So you see how these two start to flow together. And within Jill and Jazz's music, you see how their production has these bass sounds, has these kind of digitally hi hatty sounds. And that's where I thought their comparison really came in. And that wraps up our analysis section. 
Now, I hope you guys have picked up on a lot of Jasmine's preferences that I mentioned earlier. I'll just go over them, some of them again. One of Jasmine's preferences is you see a lot of her songs in about the hundreds tempos. And I think that's really interesting because a lot of her times, her songs don't feel that fast to me. And I like, I love me a slow song, child. Like, my BPM levels be like 80 to 90. Like, that's my sweet spot. That's where I like to chill. And to find out that a lot of her songs are actually in the hundreds, but they don't feel that way as she performs them and phrases them, I found that really interesting. Some of her preferred keys are A flat to B flat. She also uses E flat as well as F and as well as G. Like I said before, she likes to utilize her low register as she drops all the way down to the low threes and works her way back up. A lot of her embellishments, she loves to do runs, which of course she would do because she's super skilled at. Of course, her main um, genre of choice would be R&B, but a lot of her productions I hear, they, they kind of vary. If you th When I hear them, they vary a lot in genre, but her approach is, pre her vocal approach is pretty much similar. And with her vocal approach, she mainly utilizes her chest voice and it's like she chest, chest, chest through. And even when she pushes to her mix, her mix is so solid. It's just almost indistinguishable from her actual chest voice. So she'll power through a song chest. And when she gets to a dynamic part, she powers through even more. Which just would be amazing. That's the type of thing I want to be able to do. Here we have some of Jasmine's discography. As you see some of her works, you see her albums, see some of her singles, as well as her guest appearances. As you see, she's composed a lot, most of her songs. She's worked with people like Monica. She's worked with Anderson Park. She's worked with Mary J. Blige, Fantasia, Jennifer Hudson. Here is a bibliography. And here are our references. And... We have come to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed and I hope you guys can pull apart and see some of these connections. I hope they were apparent. I hope this will inspire your artistry and for you to pay attention to the artists that you love and build and learn from them. Now, overall, I just hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope you will go home or turn this off and stream Jasmine Sullivan and all the wonderful artists that I mentioned today. Thank you for watching.